Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Two challenges make this a fraught time in Northern Ireland. One, it can't agree on self-government, and two, Brexit. And so it's been interesting to watch in the last few days. A small number of keen Brexit supporters suggest that the 20-year-old Good Friday Agreement is past its sell-by date. Kate Hoey said it's time for a cold, rational look at it. MEP Daniel Hannan wrote a Telegraph piece arguing that British ministers should start working with their Irish counterparts on improving the system. It's gently phrased and it's not a Brexit point they're making per se, but this sentiment has only come from that side. There's an interesting linguistic point here too. Critics of the agreement tend to call it the Belfast Agreement, perhaps because Good Friday makes it sound too holy or reverential. But whatever you call it, for many, the agreement is, of course, synonymous with peace. Today, the Irish government called those who questioned it reckless. The British said they stand by it steadfastly. So what's going on? Our political editor, Nick Watt, reports. Yes, 71.12%. <laughs> British people have spoken and the answer is, we're out. They were seismic votes which are changing the intertwined history of these islands. And the legacy of those referendums, nearly two decades apart, are haunting the politics of today. Remain supporters dream of keeping the UK in the EU. And now, some Unionist supporters believe the time has come to revisit the Good Friday Agreement after last week's failure to restore power sharing. I think the word refresh of the Good Friday Agreement, or the Belfast Agreement, as I would call it, is, is actually quite important because time changes lots and lots of things. And of course, what we are seeing under direct rule, we'll have that space to look at it. We can't have a situation where there are two parties in mandatory coalition and one can always pull the plug and say we're walking away and then they don't go back in until they get some new demands. Today the government made clear it stands four square behind the agreement. As the House will recognise this April marks the 20th anniversary of the historic Belfast Agreement. That agreement along with its successors has been fundamental in helping Northern Ireland move forward from its violent past to a brighter, more secure future. And this government's support for the agreements remains steadfast, as does our commitment to govern for everyone in Northern Ireland. There is fury at senior levels of the government after some Tories lent their weight to the calls for a rethink of the Good Friday Agreement. One cabinet minister told me it would be the height of absurdity to make unilateral changes to the 1998 agreement. From the Prime Minister downwards, there is a determination to re-establish all of its institutions by brokering a deal between the DUP and Sinn Féin. But one of the original signatories to the Good Friday Agreement says the government must act by introducing a short parliamentary bill to hand the powers vested in the Northern Ireland power-sharing executive to its assembly. Instead of just going on uh, with London's uh, you know, intervening from time to time to try and do things, but not having you know, proper decisions made by people who have their roots in Northern Ireland and are accountable to the Northern Ireland electorate. I think the only way we can proceed uh, is by uh, having a situation where the Assembly can function without, ex without an executive. And I think that is possible, and it would be a way of avoiding the present impasse. A former Northern Ireland secretary who presided over changes to the Good Friday Agreement a decade ago acknowledges there is a precedent for amending the accord. But Lord Hayne warns that today's calls for change, mainly from Brexit supporters, could have grave consequences. There's no question that these Brexit extremists, in their hardline support for a particular dogmatic position of Brexit, are actually playing with fire they're endangering the peace process and they could incite dissident IRA groups who are very well armed and have made attacks and killed people in recent years but they're very isolated and marginalised at the moment. It could incite greater support for them and therefore a greater threat from them. I don't think there's any threat to the 
any long-term threat to what we agreed 20 years ago. Uh, and I don't think there's any chance of there being a breakdown and a re return to violence. Sinn Féin agrees that dissident Republicans pose no threat to the peace process, but the party warns of the dangers of challenging the Good Friday Agreement. These interventions represent nothing more than a wreckers charter. And in fact, the, the, the very wrong-headed and the irresponsible nature of the interventions at this particular point in time, in fact, exaggerate the extent of the political crisis that we are living through. The Good Friday Agreement has been under relentless pushback from sections of political unionism from it was first signed. Referendums are meant to settle political disputes for a generation. From the Good Friday Agreement to Brexit, we are learning that to some, they are not the final word. Nick Watt reporting. Well, I'm joined uh, from Dublin by the Minister for European Affairs in the Irish Government, Helen McEntee. A very good evening to you. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, what's your reaction to this debate that's cropped up over the last few days in this, uh, in this country? Well, what I would welcome firstly is uh, comments by Karen Bradley and other members of the British government uh, who have very clearly said that the Good Friday Agreement um, is the only way to move forward and is essentially the only show in town. The Good Friday Agreement is an international peace treaty and it has been for the past 20 years the only way that every political voice, every political view and expression um, has been heard and can be heard and I think for suggestions or, or any suggestions that have been made that it is past its sell-by date, that it is no longer of use. Um, I would ask those people to maybe reflect on what things were like 20 years ago before the Good Friday Agreement was in place. So I welcome confirmation from the, the British government that this let's is the only way forward and obviously the Irish government are very much of that same yeah. opinion. Let's, let's break this down a little bit. I mean, just what would happen if the British government did unilaterally change aspects of the Good Friday Agreement in an attempt to try and make it work better, for example. I mean, what actually happens if it does do that? Well, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement is an international peace treaty. It's a, it's a young peace treaty, and to try and change that, you're essentially changing the way in which um, citizens north and south, east and west, uh, work with each other, engage with each other and what we've seen over the past 20 years is that we have been able to work together thus uh, parties in the north have been able to work in a power sharing executive. Yes we have hit a bump in the road um, but I don't think that means that we need to completely change path it just means that we need to work together to get back on right. track and obviously that is our focus, the Irish government's focus to work with the British government but the two main parties in the north to get the executive up and running um, and to make sure that all elements of the Good Friday Agreement Agreement can be upheld and that all those expressions um, can be upheld also. Right. I'm um, obviously you can't just go on forever pretending the Good Friday Agreement's working if it's not delivering an assembly or a, uh, an executive in Northern Ireland that's operating. And I, how long do you think you give it before everybody has to sit down and think again? I mean, it's been what a 13 months now. I mean, do you just go on and on and on saying yes, let's try, let's try, and let's try? Well, I mean, I think it is disappointing that we are over a year on and that we don't have an executive. And, and I think last week's um, events were obviously of concern, but there are a number of mechanisms through which uh, we can ensure that there is uh, work underway and, and, and happening in Northern Ireland, obviously the executive being the most important one, but we also have areas of cooperation north and south, the North-South Ministerial Council and also the British-Irish Council, and we need to make sure in the absence of a functioning executive that they are given the powers and the ability to uphold all these elements of the Good Friday Agreement. Ah. So you've, you've said something focus, very however, important there. Sorry, needs to be. sorry to interrupt, but you've said something very important there. Is that your backstop substitute for the working of an executive and an assembly is your your substitute is joint sovereignty of the the, the republic and the uk over northern ireland is that how, is that what you want to see effectively if the parties in the north don't get together well, what we want to see is an executive functioning in the north and what we will do is work with the British I government understand that, but and that, that, with the two it, major parties to make sure that that will and happen. And plan B, However, what's your plan B? Mechanisms, but those mechanisms are already in place. The Northern, uh, the North South Ministerial Council and the British right. Irish Council are already there. They are already functioning um, and in the absence of 
an executive, obviously, we need to make sure that they work to the best of their ability. But our focus, our priority, I understand. Priority I understand your focus has to be. I understand the, uh, that the, the, getting the it to work. Of the executive. Yeah, yeah. What about plans to reform the way Northern Ireland works? I mean, maybe you you could say. You move to the Welsh model. The Assembly chooses the executive. You don't enshrine in an international peace treaty, uh, you know, a coalition that is permanently going to operate between these two sides. You, you say, we'll let the Assembly pick it. Now, would you, if, if they can't get it together, would you be open to the idea of joint talks, not unilateral ones, but joint talks in which that was the kind of thing on the table? The Good Friday Agreement has, uh, I think, the full support of uh, the Northern Ireland citizens and also citizens in the Republic as well. And, and I heard uh, the statistics at the beginning of the show, over 71% of people overwhelmingly voted in favour of this process, of this mechanism of joint power, of cooperation. And in the South, those figures were near to 94%. So I think the idea of starting to change it, to amend it in any way, when it has worked very successfully, as I've said, yes, we have hit a bump in the road, yet there are, yes, there are challenges, and there are challenges not just um, in Northern Ireland, but obviously with Brexit, and, and we are dealing with those. Um, but I think the Good Friday Agreement is something that we need uh, to work with, and we need to Helen work McEntee. within those parameters, because it has been proven to work over the past 20 Helen years. Helen McEntee, that point you've made very, very clearly indeed. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, Nick Watt uh, is back with me now and joins us uh, with news of further ructions, Brexit ructions in the Tory party uh, this evening. Nick, what has been happening? Well, it's interesting. I was talking to a member, a Remain member of the Cabinet this afternoon who was very happy, very cheerful after the speech today by David Davis when he said the UK would not have a race to the bottom with the EU. And then this afternoon, this letter from 62 members of the Eurosceptic European Research Group was leaked to Sam Coates of the Times and this makes clear for example that they take a much more restrictive view of what the implementation the transition period so these should guys be are like. harder line than David Davis was sounding when he made his business it, it would today. appear to be that that is their position and they're essentially saying to the Prime Minister be very careful don't go too far in what you concede and I've been talking to sources in the European Research Group and they are saying there are hundreds of us, that's our message to number 10, so you'd better watch out. But interestingly, they're saying their real target is not Theresa May. It's the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Jeremy Hayward, and the UK's chief EU negotiator, Ollie, Ollie, Ollie Robbins. They are concerned that they are going to lay down some sort of what they regard as tricks, so that in 30 months' time, when we're fully out of the EU, the UK's hands could be very restricted. Just very briefly, what about Labour? I, I, I think there's been something tonight. Has the language changed? Have they inched towards a clear position on whether we're in the customs union or out of the customs union? On their, well, so Jeremy new... Corbyn said that the UK would have to be in a customs union right. with the EU. That would be important to sort of sort out the Northern Ireland border. So that's not the customs union. Labour says they can't be in that because you've got to respect the result of the referendum. But the reason why they say you could be in a customs union and not in the single market <laughs> right. is that you don't have the regulatory requirements or the European Court of Justice jurisdiction over that. Thanks, Nick. I've been getting away with it all.